This is a production of PBS Charlotte. James Buchanan Duke entered the world with the deck stacked against him. But often, out of struggle, comes success. You know, when you start poor on a farm raising tobacco and you figure out how to make that into an industry, then you know how to be an entrepreneur. The tobacco industry pushed Duke and his family out of poverty. James Buchanan Duke is truly a tycoon. During his lifetime, Duke disrupted the cigarette industry with creative marketing and more efficient manufacturing processes, then transitioned his wealth into textiles and electric power generation, and brought prosperity to the Charlotte region. But it's his philanthropic work that cemented Duke's legacy across the Carolinas. It's the classic mantra, right, for those um, to whom much is given, much is expected, and he gave back to the Carolinas in a major way. Meet Brett Grill, the artist tasked with creating this larger-than-life statue of Duke. You sort of have one shot with a sculpture. You need to tell their story in one moment. This is the story of James Buchanan Duke's life, from farm to tycoon, and his legacy of generosity. Steel, concrete, and glass define Charlotte's modern skyline. It's an impressive sight James B. Duke likely never imagined. His entrepreneurial spirit in the first quarter of the 20th century helped lay the foundation for the city and region we know today. James B. Duke was a father. He was the founder of what was Duke Power, now as Duke Energy. He was an industrialist and also a philanthropist. Duke is truly a tycoon. He believes wholeheartedly in the potential of markets, um, and he looked at particularly tobacco and the cigarette business as boundless. Duke's own foundation, his humble roots, were anchored in rural North Carolina where fields of tobacco once dominated farms across the state. It was once a major cash crop that fueled the old North State's economy. And along the way, for some, it created great fortune. And for Duke's fortune, those seeds were sown here in Durham, North Carolina. When Washington Duke moves here in 1852, it's with his second wife. He's just gotten married to Artelia Roney Duke and they move in here with his two children from his first marriage. Um, his first wife, Mary Caroline Clinton, passes away. Soon after moving to the homestead, they quickly added to their family with the birth of a daughter, Mary, a son, Benjamin, and in December of 1856, James Buchanan Duke. Tragically, at the age of 29, Artelia passed away, leaving Washington Duke with five children. Hardships for the Duke family continued as the Civil War loomed on the horizon. Washington is actually conscripted into the Confederate Navy, um, so he has to leave the homestead and leave his youngest children in 1864 to go to war. Washington Duke was captured by Union troops and spent the rest of the Civil War in a prison camp. As the story goes, when the war ends. He was released in Richmond at the end of the war, walked home, had, you know, 50 cents and some tobacco seeds in his pocket. Um, but he got home, didn't find much there except for some dried tobacco in his barn. And uh, that's 1865. He sets up this um, tobacco manufacturing business. And their primary product here from the homestead is pipe tobacco. And the company's name is W. Duke and Sons. So he always envisions it as a family business. And um, in its earliest years from about 1865, to 1874, um, it truly is a family business, all hands on deck, even his daughter Mary is helping with the business. So they set up a small tobacco factory here, they're using just a small corn crib that they already had on the property, and they are doing the kind of very simple manual process of producing pipe tobacco. 
James Buchanan Duke, when it's his turn to go to school, actually only completes a half a term, um, and he can't stand it. You know, he's not interested in learning about literature or history. He wants to get hands-on with the business. That's what he wants to do. Um, so he kind of comes back and pleads with his father to actually attend a business school in New York uh, for the purpose of being able to benefit the family business. So when James Buchanan Duke comes back, they're at that stage of growth and expansion thereafter that um, they move into downtown Durham and build a bigger factory right on the railroad to continue expanding. He was a genius. Um, from an early age when his brother and his father and him worked in the tobacco business, he uh, figured out very quickly uh, how to grow the business, how to make the business work, how to market uh, the product, and, and quickly became the dominant force in, in the business. Originally, the Duke family sold pipe tobacco packaged in small cotton bags. But in 1885, James Duke saw a new opportunity for the family business. He took a great gamble, convinced his father and his brother to take a gamble and implement the Bonsack cigarette machine, which was the, the first mechanized manufacturer of cigarettes, which changed the tobacco business and really changed the world, if you think about it. Lower labor cost and creative marketing put James Duke in the family business in a unique position. In just a few years time after introducing the technology of the Bonsack machine, he's able to leverage all of this against his competitors and draw them together into a trust, and that is the American Tobacco Company. The formation of the trust created the largest tobacco company in the world and control of 90% of the American cigarette market. But the good times would be short-lived. The year that the American Tobacco Company is founded, 1890, is also the year that the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed. The Sherman Antitrust Act bans monopolies. It takes a good while for the um, Department of Justice to actually start enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act. So it's not until 1907 that um, the Department of Justice actually comes for them. And it's not until 1911 that they actually manage to break the American Tobacco Company up. By the time the government broke up the American Tobacco Company, James B. Duke, along with his brother Benjamin, already started diversifying the family's investments. His family is investing in other industries, particularly textile mills. Um, and as they invest in textile mills, they see the potential of hydroelectric power. It was Duke's personal physician that first sparked the notion of getting into the electric power business. James B. Duke and his brother had interests in the textile businesses. Um, again, Dr. Gil Wiley, who was the physician for um, Mr. Duke, they were in conversation during a, a, a doctor appointment, and Dr. Gil Wiley was speaking about harnessing the power of the Catawba River. He and his brother had started the Catawba Power Company, which was um, around India Hook, South Carolina. Around 1902, the Dukes invested in the Catawba Power Company. Not long after, they bought out controlling interests in the company from the Wiley brothers. And in 1904, the company built the first hydroelectric dam on the Catawba River, creating Lake Wiley. I think what James B. Duke brought to the mix was, of course, the monetary funding but he was very conservative and you had to prove to him or he had to understand the method for which this money was going to be used to make sure that he was just not throwing money at some process that would not bring him um, some investment or some gain. James B. Duke amassed a tremendous fortune, but his family values guided his choices. His father was a devout Methodist. Methodism uh, really influenced how the family perceived their role in the community, um, and from a very early time believed in giving back um, and investing wisely in philanthropy. The family's philanthropy started in the 1890s, really, um, uh, once they had accumulated significant resources, and, uh, and it focused around um, healthcare, um, education, orphanages, childcare, if you will, and the, and the Methodist Church. And three decades later, James B. Duke carried on the family legacy.
it's fascinating because he was first and foremost a businessman. Uh, but today, perhaps we know him best for his philanthropy. And his philosophy was uh, build the, the economic infrastructure and uh, build that. Uh, and then um, take the resources that are um, spun off by the economic uh, infrastructure and invest those back into the community. So he really did um, put his money where his mouth was. And with that commitment to give back, Duke set aside $40 million in 1924, forming the Duke Endowment. At the time of his death in 1925, the endowment received another $67 million from his estate the endowment's focus. The cool thing about the endowment is that it focuses only on North and South Carolina um, and it's very focused on what it does. It gives money to four um, institutions of higher education, it gives money to not-for-profit hospitals and healthcare organizations, um, children and family service organizations, and the Rural Methodist Church in North Carolina. I think Mr. Duke would be absolutely amazed at Duke University today. Duke University uh, has truly become an international institution and one of the great universities uh, of, the, of the world. And, uh, and to think about how this little college in Durham, North Carolina in 1924, in a very short period of time, has become one of the world's leading universities is just, uh, it's mind boggling. The endowment also gives grants to Davidson College, Johnson C. Smith University, and Furman University. Since its establishment in 1924, the Duke Endowment has distributed some $3 billion and continues to carry on James B. Duke's spirit of philanthropy. A foundation grounded in generosity is personal for endowment trustee Charlie Lucas, the great-great-grandson of Benjamin Duke, James Duke's brother. It's humbling, uh, to say the least, to, to try and carry on the legacy of this great man and to, uh, to play a part in carrying on the family's legacy around philanthropy and, and uh, uh, the family's place in North Carolina history. In one of Charlotte's oldest neighborhoods stands the Duke Mansion. It starts when you turn in the driveway and you have this beautiful, gracious drive sided by ancient boxwoods. You pull up and there's that fountain that is a remnant of Mr. Duke's ability to show what the power company could do. And then you walk in and you see the black and white marble floors and you say, there's nothing else like this in Charlotte. When Duke purchased the house, he already owned a home in New Jersey and an office in New York. But the Duke Mansion brought him and his family closer to his southern roots. In 1919, his purchase of his Myers Park home um, was where he lived until his death. And it was also a purchase that brought his um, one and only child, Doris Duke, to Charlotte, where he wanted to have her experience the southern life, southern culture. There are great stories about Mr. Duke hosting Doris's birthday party, and each girl that came to the birthday party also got a gift, and all the gifts were from Tiffany. So they were pretty involved. Um, she had lifelong friends that she met while she lived here and that lived in the same neighborhood. So I think life was as good as it could be in the 1920s, right? The mansion is a historical treasure for Charlotte. It was in this very room Duke and his attorneys established the Duke Endowment. But after his death, the mansion passed through several owners and at one time was nearly lost. It's had a rough and tumble um, history itself and, uh, and we're all glad that it's been preserved um, for, for the community. As you can imagine, a home of this size is pricey to maintain. Today, the Linwood Foundation, a nonprofit, protects this century-old structure. Today, we're a corporate conference center, bed and breakfast, and a special event place. So people do meetings here, they do family special events, they do corporate special events. So we're sort of a small specialty hotel. And then to walk around the Duke Mansion and to see uh, ultimately um, 
uh, what was Mr. Duke's southern headquarters, if you will, is also humbling. And, and of course, the grounds today are named for my grandmother, um, but the mansion itself is, uh, is a testament to Mr. Duke's success uh, and, and ultimately, I think today, plays a unique role in Charlotte uh, as a gathering place and as, a, as a, a place where the community can come together. Charlotte's Little Sugar Creek Greenway attracts thousands of people who seek time outdoors. If you find yourself taking a stroll or bike ride near Moorhead and Kings, you'll likely come across the statue of James B. Duke. This monument is part of the Trail of History Statue Project. It's a new interpretation of the legendary industrialist. The process to create the statue started here in artist Brett Grill's Michigan studio. And like Duke, Grill has the spirit of an entrepreneur. I studied painting in graduate school. I did some sculptures on the side just to put food on the table as a, as a poor graduate student. And that, that's something that sort of gained legs. The beginning of the project always begins with, with research. So that starts in really boring ways, like going to Wikipedia and, and getting the you know, Cliff's Notes version of, of who the person that I'm going to be depicting is. And then I try to continue to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, I traveled to North Carolina, spent some time in, in Charlotte. Um, I try to do as much reading as possible. Um, I also went to Durham. Um, you know, Duke University maintains an archive of a lot of the material. When I'm reading, I read with uh, the intention to, to find certain things, bits about their character, what drove them, what their values are, things like that. He, he is somebody who is, um, in, in some ways, a, genuine but, but a, a little bit guarded about you know, get, getting close to just, just anybody. Um, uh, but also, uh, by a lot of counts, you know, somebody that is uh, sort of dignified and, and regal. Um, there are uh, several accounts of the people that worked for him just wanting to, to please him because he seemed like somebody who had the, you know, highest character. Grill interprets these characteristics into his work. There's so many different ways that you can move a body around that can tell different stories of, about a person, um, how they hold themselves, what, what, the, what they're wearing, you know, what's, what's surrounding them, all those things can, can tell a very different picture. I mean, in, in, in some ways it's exactly like what a historian would do in, in writing, you know, a, a, a bio of, of a person. You know, they're going to be presented with a lot of raw data and they have to figure out how to shape it in a way that, that can tell a story that they think is valid. I, I think that process is actually kind of freeing. There's a lot of anxiety in uh, making the sculpture. Um, am I making the right decision? Is this something that is going to, you know, honor the life and the contribution that the individual had to, you know, their town or, you know, America more broadly? Um, once it's out in the world, uh, I can't second guess myself anymore. Um, it, you know, it becomes part of the fabric of the place, um, and that that is is freeing and kind of kind of great. You know, it's it's wonderful when I see one of my sculptures in the world and somebody standing next to it taking a selfie or, or, or something. It means that they're you know all of a sudden familiar with the story that they might not have been familiar with otherwise. Um, and they're, you know, it's become part of the fabric of their town and their lives. So that, that feels great. It's part art and part engineering. When I make a large sculpture, I have to, you know, weld a, a steel skeleton that will hold up all the clay, which would naturally fall over under its, its weight. You know, a project like this is, is collaborative too. Um, so I get done with the clay in my studio and make a mold of it, and then I send it off to the foundry. And while I'll visit the foundry two or three times during the process, I need to allow them to use their expertise, um, which means that, you know, tiny things might, might change a little bit, and I need to be okay with that. But ultimately, it's a, it's a place and, you know, expert metal workers that I have an established relationship with, and I trust the expertise that they bring to the project. After two years of research and countless hours in the studio, 
Grill made the trip to Charlotte to deliver his masterpiece. Well, today we're replacing the sculpture, so all the landscaping is done. Three days before the public unveiling, construction workers drill seven holes into a concrete pad. Then hoist the statue up in the air. Grill and others thread long bolts into the base before filling the holes with a special epoxy. They only have minutes before it hardens. And with a final nudge, the statue of James B. Duke is set in place. I think that the visibility was good. It's, it's framed nice by the background of the buildings and uh, obviously it's highly trafficked, so it's, uh, I, I think it'll be really nice. We are ecstatic to be here today. It is amazing how challenging these projects are. Um, when you show up and everything is, is done and pristine, there's a lot of hard work and effort and planning and design and some arguments um, that got us here, but it's all for one goal and the goal is uh, to celebrate a man and his impact on our community and to celebrate something in Charlotte that for too long we have taken for granted and ignored, which is our history. James B. Duke became one of the greatest industrialists of the 20th century. His businesses took him to New York, to London, all over, but his heart was in the Carolinas. He never lost his deep love for the Carolinas. Like other men and women who are represented here by the Trail of History, Mr. Duke lived a life of purpose and also meaning, and he worked very hard on behalf of others. We're grateful for the opportunity to honor the lasting legacies of all of the individuals who are represented here with the Trail of History, and we particularly are very grateful to all of you who are part of the Trail of History Board of Directors for selecting Mr. Duke to be part of this amazing project. Well, the Duke family is so grateful to be a part of this Thank you for selecting Mr. Duke to be part of the Trail of History. And along with all the other statues, we hope that this is an inspiration to, to everyone to remember our history uh, and to, to remember the great men and women who've made us what we are today. So thank you very much. When that fabric comes off and you see it, and you see the energy and the emotion, see the vision in his eyes, which is really was well captured by the artist, um, it's, uh, it's, a pretty special, it's a pretty special moment to uh, truly deliver something of lasting value uh, for all of Charlotte. It's, um, it's humbling. Artist Brett Grill says the statue's placement and accessibility are key in his interpretation of James B. Duke. I wanted him to be anchored on the ground. I wanted him to be uh, maybe a little bit less formal. You know, his coat is undone. It's kind of billowing behind him as he walks forward into the future. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I wanted him to, to feel like a, a man of the people because, you know, as the endowment shows, that's really what he cared about. Duke descendant Charlie Lucas says the statue surpassed his expectations. We couldn't be more pleased. Uh, you know, we've, we've watched its progress over the last few years and we've seen Brett's mar markups and, and all of that and it's just turned out so beautifully, much, frankly, much better than we even uh, thought, it, uh, thought it was going to. So it's, it's a, this is a great legacy for the Trail of History and for the people of Charlotte Mecklenburg. Here on the Greenway, the statue of James B. Duke stands in the shadow of Charlotte's modern skyline. Fittingly, just over his shoulder, Duke Energy power lines feed electricity to the region. Nearby is the Duke Mansion, and perhaps his greatest legacy is just a few blocks away, the headquarters for the James B. Duke Endowment. When you think about Charlotte, you think about the Piedmont Carolinas, um, it would be a very different place today. His vision for creating this economic and, and ultimately power infrastructure that drove economic development in the Carolinas was something that frankly pulled us out of the 19th century and pointed us in the direction of the 21st century. He was visionary in, in many ways. James Buchanan Duke, a visionary born on a rural homestead in Durham, North Carolina, a visionary who saw opportunity in business, and a visionary remembered not for his great wealth and power, but his lasting legacy of philanthropy.
production of PBS Charlotte.